the people who write the software may, I don't know, they could be dead. <laughs>
ends a certain way, usually returning a certain value, um, and you change the way that it works, now the program's expectations don't match what the library offers. So technically you've changed the application programming interface or API for the library. Um, another thing I did not consider was that there needs to be a way for programs that are loading different versions of the library to handle these different versions that it's loading. It needs to be able to be linked to a library that perhaps is older but still has support for everything that it needs um, or to specify that I need a certain minimum version. So libjody code 1 didn't have this. I thought about it for a while and in 2.0 I implemented a versioning system that not only does it hard code the version, the version date, um, and API levels for each C file I have an API level number and each of those numbers increments when changes are made to it. So not only can this thing look and see, hey, okay, you got, you know, your, your API version is X, but also your sub API, the, the sub API that's not compatible is Y. So it could find incompatible changes and give you verbose information about, hey, hey, you've updated this library on your system and it's got an incompatible API that we care about. So it, it lets the program crash gracefully explaining that this is not going to work because there are incompatibilities. But I didn't think things through again because what happens? Well, let's say cache info, just as an example. Let's say the API for cache, actually size suffix, because that's the one that got me. So size suffix is just a static table of suffixes for sizes, obviously. You have a file size, and it's say a thousand bytes or whatever, or a million bytes. You want to find um, a suffix to go with that. Well, or you have a suffix specified. This is what JDoops does with the dash X, the capital X filter. It uses the size suffix table to scan for the suffix at the end of a number in the table and then use the multipliers that are found there. Well, I decided I wanted to add the binary shift values because a C compiler can multiply um, and it'll spit out a multiply instruction, but it's faster to do bit shifting. Um, and plus, there are some things that you can't exactly do the same way, like with a bit shift, you can also create a mask. Anyway, I wanted to add shifts to the size suffix numbers, but that represents a change in the structure, which represents a change in the data and how it's represented in, a, in, in you know, how the API works. So now we've got an API break. And with size suffix changing, of course it's incompatible. But what if I change cache info, or like just today actually, as of making this video, I changed alarms to increment the ring number instead of just putting one. And all the programs are ever supposed to do is check to see if the number isn't zero anymore and go, oh, it's not zero, take action. But I had a program that might miss an alarm due to doing really long file operations. And in the process of missing this alarm, um, it may count two seconds as one and show a false, much faster transfer rate than is actually happening. So I, I upgraded the alarm API. Instead of just going one, it'll count the number of alarms, which happens every second or whatever, that have gone off. And you have to manually clear it anyway. But now, if you care about how many seconds you missed the alarm, It'll just keep racking up alarm seconds or intervals um, until you clear it yourself and you can add that number, whatever it is, one, two, ten, however many seconds were missed, and it gives you much more accurate timing information. So this API change, programs are just supposed to be checking and seeing if the alarm value is non-zero, the alarm ring value is non-zero. But what happens? when you make this change that the programs that exist can still use, but it, it's a new feature. And the programs that care about the amount of time, well, 
those programs, what are they supposed to do? So we have a problem, right? Now, and I'm going to have to park this car. Give me just a second. We have a problem where our alarm API works. So we've made a change that is not incompatible. But this, this semi-compatible change, a program relies on it. I, is specifically, my program is called Zero Merge. That's the one that relies on it. So what we do, if we increment the API level, well, that's an incompatible change. We need the program to be able to say, I need this optional, like this feature upgrade. If we add an API, for example, adding an API to the library, well, if, if an older program doesn't have the new API, it doesn't know it, it, it that it exists, then my checker code, all it'll do is say, oh, you know, we've reached the, the list of, end of the list of known APIs and all the comparisons came out fine. So what are we going to do? Well, we don't know about these new APIs. We don't use them. We don't care about them. We'll ignore them. <clears throat> but what happens when an existing API gets changed in a compatible way that adds new features, like a new call or whatever? So I added a lib Jody code, not just version, but then feature level, which sort of acts as a version number without the whole major minor revision scheme. Because the standard way to do this versioning stuff, if you make an API breaking change, you change the major version. So libjody code 1, 2, or 3, they all have incompatible API changes. But libjody code 3.1 has a newer feature set. But the existing feature set is unchanged. It's not broken anything. It's only added. If you just do a straight version comparison, you can't really tell. And if you try to be like, oh, let's compare, you know, libjody code 3 or 3.1 or whatever, it gets complicated because now programs have to go and do this nonsense where they pick apart the semantic version, the major, minor, revision, all that. And in fact, for a little while there, I was trying to put predefined major, minor version and have programs check that. I soon realized how dumb that was because now there's going to be all this extra code in every program that links to the library that wants to make sure it has the certain minimums met where it's picking apart this version number and that's just ridiculous. Instead, what we do is we collapse the version number. So now, if features change, we have a feature level and if, that, if those features change in a compatible way, like we just added new ones, we increment the feature level for every time a set of features changes. So if I add a bunch of calls to every single API, I've not broken the existing ones, but I've added new features. Increment the feature level. Anything that relies on those features should go in and use that higher feature level in its checking code. And all this crazy stuff is just so that programs can determine if the library that they're linked to is compatible. It's a whole lot of work just to do something as simple as, hey, am I going to work properly with you? I can't tell, but I need, I need to be able to tell. I'm, somehow you have to be able to relay to me that I'm going to be functional. And that's what we're up against. This is just the compatibility check side of things. All this talking has just been, hey, is, hey, will my library that is on this system work with this JDoops binary that God knows when it was built? Was it, you know, if you run a binary that links to a dynamic lib Jody code, it needs to be new enough to have the feature sets that are required. So setting up all this um, basically forced me to change the API number twice because the first time I just had some version stuff. The second time I redid the way that some of this stuff worked and I added the feature level and I also made an incompatible change to the size suffix table. That's how we got the three. Going from one to two I added the version checking stuff and made API changes and fixed like some exit codes or whatever. Then three, I mean, so we, we have a bunch of crazy stuff, and this is just, what have we covered? We've covered the API change because of the exits, and we've covered the version checking, and that's basically it. Those are just, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Then there's this other debate. If I have libjody code, one, two, and three, well, if you have a program that depends on version one or depends on version two, and then you have a program that depends on version three, 
you need to be able to keep the older versions lying around. So should my make system rename libjodycode.so whatever to libjodycode2? Should there be separate manuals for each one? Should, should each one be its own standalone thing? And I ultimately decided no, my build system shouldn't be auto renaming it and it would make things even more complicated. But when you're linking shared libraries and binaries, it gets so complicated. And I had no idea, and there's even this embedded SO name that sort of serves the same function as the API level, except it can be checked by like the linker. Um, just, there's all these details I didn't know about. It, it's been a crazy uphill battle. And I've grown a um, pretty great appreciation for just how crappy it is to plan this stuff out. Because what I've realized, even just today, if I have a function and I want to add an argument to it, if I want to change the behavior of what it does, I have to either make a breaking change that breaks all existing software and increment the API, meaning a new version, which means you could have three or four versions of this thing lying around because I made one breaking change. Or I have to add a new API with a new name that is parallel to the existing one that does the new behavior, but then keep the old one around as well, which means that you have two versions of this thing that do slightly different things, but it's really the same general thing. So the ideal would be just screw it, break it, break it and make it better. And for a while there, that's kind of what I felt like I should do, but I realized, no, I need to not do that. I need to increment the API as needed, but if we're going to have to add stuff in the future, we need to just add on to it, not break the existing stuff. There's no good answer. It's the same thing with managing shared libraries on a system. If there's with the whole versioning thing and linking, and I add the libjody code check code, I add that to my projects that link to it to at least try to resolve some of these issues. The program can tell if you're using an incompatible version and it can let you know that that's the problem. Most programs either will act weird or crash or if it's missing it'll just be like can't find library <clears throat> and none of that is very helpful at least at least what I've got if the library can be found it can complain about the library being incompatible but I had to write all that crap myself there's not some sort of built-in mechanism to do this I had to come up with all that the only built-in mechanism is like naming like .so.3 for API 3 and, and a program compiled for API 2 looks for .so.2. Um, .so.2 won't exist on a system that only has API 3 versions of libjody code. So I feel like this is already just sounds so ridiculous. How many of you are seriously still listening to this at this point? It's friggin' nuts. Anyway, the struggle is real. So. One of the biggest problems that I have with Linux in general um, is this whole notion that some people have that you can make changes that break stuff and just be like, oh yeah, we don't have to do anything to tell the user. If it's a problem, then the people who write the software should fix their software. But that's not how it works. The people who write the software may, I don't know, they could be dead. What if the original author's dead and nobody's really maintaining the software? What if the software is like Fluxbox? Fluxbox hasn't been updated in years, at least the version number hasn't, and the only updates have been incremental. Let's get these windows cracked a bit so that it won't be too hot when I come back to the car. But Fluxbox is basically considered feature complete. There are no changes or updates or anything happening to it. So if something happens that breaks it, it's not Fluxbox's fault. Something else has changed that broke it. And that is a no-no. In fact, um, I just watched or listened to a talk by Linus Torvalds about, about the whole why Linux sucks thing. And I was, I was thinking more along the lines of like the DLL hell or whatever, but he went more with the route where we work in kernel space and the number one only real hard and fast rule is you don't break user space. And people try to break user space and I yell at them. 
And that's the problem. You're like, if someone relies on your code, that code shouldn't change out from under them. And if it does, it needs to do so in a way that makes the old stuff still work. This is one of the major reasons that people still use Windows instead of Linux. I, I can go and get a Windows program as long as it's 32-bit. I can go get a Windows application from Windows 95 era as long as it's 32-bit clean. There's no 16-bit code. And run it on a brand new Windows 10 64-bit machine and there is a 95% chance it will work. If I set the compatibility options, maybe. But there's a very high chance it'll work because Windows cares about compatibility. And people complain all the time about, why do we keep all this garbage around? Why don't you just break the old stuff? Get rid of this old stuff. It's bad. You need to just toss like all the old unscalable this, that, and the other. You need to toss the old like vectorized. You know, we, we want to put all modern stuff, get rid of all the old crust. But the problem with that is that's the whole reason that Windows is great in the first place is that it supports the old stuff. Because if you need an old piece of software or an old library, it will work. You don't break user space just because you have this notion that everything should be modern, shiny, and new. And everybody who thinks that compatibility is stupid and you should just push forward and progress is always good, they've never dealt with that. So. Making my shared library has given me a new, nasty, aggressive appreciation for just how crappy it really is to do all of that compatibility work. There are so many things that go into it, and it is hard, annoying, and not very rewarding work. But it's the work you have to do if you're going to create code that other people are going to rely on. Anyway, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Even though no one named Ted is here, i got to go buy some wood. So thanks for listening. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill. Take care.